to start out with, just to get a little bit of background and context, if you could tell us your name and a little bit about yourself, like where you grew up, how you came to work in libraries. Oh, oh I'd love to. I'd love to. Yeah, okay. My name is Rachel Nelson, and how did I come to libraries? One day, way back when, I mean really way back when, I was walking home from the music school settlement from a lesson, stopped in the superior branch of the Cleveland Public Library to get some books, which I did every Saturday. This one particular Saturday when I walked in, I loved it. I thought, this is wonderful. There were people milling around. It was just an atmosphere that I just... I don't know what happened. And I came home, and I was 17 at the time. I came home and I said to my parents, I think I want to be a librarian. Well, in those days, a librarian <clears throat> was kind of an old maid kind of thing, nevertheless. So I became a librarian and I never regretted a minute. I loved it, every minute that I worked. But And I think about those times when I just walked. I didn't want to go home. I didn't want to finish walking home. I enjoyed it so. Yeah. So you grew up in Cleveland? I grew up in Cleveland my whole life. Went to school. I went to school, interestingly enough, on the co-op plan. I went to college six months and worked six months. And where did I work? In the Cleveland Public Library downtown. And the co-op plan, then cooperative, I guess they called it, uh, you graduated in five years instead of four because you took six months off each year. But I was fortunate enough to work so close to, the, to Cleveland College, where I went to school downtown, that I could take classes on my lunch hour, and I graduated in four years instead of five. Mm -hmm. And then I, then I had a scholarship to the library school, and in 1948, I became the young adult librarian at East 131st, East 131st Street Library in Cleveland, and I loved it. Yeah. I loved it. So where did your connection with Heights Libraries begin? Back then. When I was working then at the 131st Street Library, my boss was a very good friend of the director of the Cleveland Heights Library then, and she said to me one day, Rachel, she said, there's an opening in the Cleveland Heights Library. Nell, my friend Nell, told me this, and she said, I think you would, you would do well there, um, and I think you would move ahead faster. And I didn't really want to do it because I loved 131st Street Library, the cutest little kids you ever saw. I was a young adult librarian, but I just loved the whole thing. But I did go and apply. Mm -hmm. And I got the job as the librarian of the Coventry Library, which was the assistant library, which was then the main library of the Cleveland Heights system. So that was in 1954 that I started. Mm -hmm. All right. So what then is one of your best memories of working here? Mm. Too many. <laughs> Too many. There are so, so many. Um... I think one of my best memories is when I was already director then. That was probably in 1990 or something like that. 19, I became director in 1988. I received a letter from the editor of the library journal, and the letter said that, we, that our library was selected as one of the best in the country. I almost fell off my chair. I was so excited. And that was all that was said. I mean, you were one of the best. And that um, something would follow. And I can't remember what followed, really. I was so excited. But I immediately sent out a memo to all the board and say, you've made this hat, and so on. But I did find out Within the year, what had happened, it seems that each state librarian in the, you know, there's a state librarian for each state, uh, was asked to nominate the best library that they knew of in their state. Okay. And we were nominated. All right. Yeah. 
That was very exciting. I think if you go in the archives, you'll find the stuff. It was just wonderful, wonderful. Mm -hmm. That was, and then of course, all the levies that we won were very exciting because we were the first library to go for a levy after oh, many, 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 many years ago. They may have, but um, in the 60s, when funding got tough, Sarah Cody, who was the director, and I was the assistant director, and I decided, and with the board, we decided that we needed to go for a levy, and we didn't know, you know. But we passed it with over 63% the very first time, the first levy, and we always passed our levies. But that that was a very exciting evening. Mm -hmm. we, yeah. Yeah, definitely. So you started out working at Coventry mm -hmm. at Maine, or when Coventry yeah. was Maine. Yeah. And you made your way up to director. What was kind of your track in between? In between. Um, when I have to say it right. I, I was assistant uh, librarian at, at Coventry. So when an opening occurred at the University Heights Library, I, I was appointed librarian of the University Heights Library. But this is how times have changed. I was 29 years old, and the reason that I was appointed is that I was young and energetic, but that Miss Lynch had found Wilma Kitson, who was working at the Lee Library, which was the, the this building was originally Lee, who was older than I and, and had worked for years. And she and I, I was librarian and she was assistant library, and she was there to stabilize me because I was only 29 years old. How times have changed. Yeah. How t I mean, it, it, it was really kind of the talk of library circles. In, particularly in the Cleveland Public Library, because there was that was such a big system, and they had so many to draw from. They didn't have to go immediately to the young, mm -hmm. you know. But so I stayed at University Heights until I wasn't married till probably sixty two, maybe from from fifty eight okay. to sixty two, when Miss Clark, who was the librarian of Coventry left. Then I came back to Coventry. I started at Coventry. Then I came back as the librarian at Coventry. And I stayed there until we we built the main library, till we did this building over. Mm -hmm. And then I came over here. And, and there was no assistant director position before me. Okay. So I was given that position. And I stayed here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And ultimately became director. I think in 1988, I became okay. director. So, what year did they redo the Lee Building for as a main library? Yeah. yeah. Well, I should. 68, we had our open house. They probably started work in 63, 64. Again, we had to pass a bond issue. Okay. Yeah. Mm, that and we did with no trouble. So we did all our levies and we did our bond issue. Yeah, and we had a big opening in 68. Okay. Yeah, 68 is when this when this opened as, as the main library of mm -hmm. Cleveland Heights. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. And you were director from 1988 to? to th no, I was director from, I retired in 1988. I was director from 78. 78, okay. 78 to 88. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Just trying to get it done. Yeah, wow. right. And and as I say, I have to think about I hadn't thought about it all this. Yeah. But yeah. I should have looked in the book. <laughs> True. So you've been you were involved with Heights Libraries for a long period of time. I was, and as Miss Lynch, who was to who was the director who hired me actually, when I became director, she said to me, Rachel, she said, you have done every position in the Heights Library, she said, except cataloging, <laughs> which is true. <laughs> yeah, I did, I did, and I loved, I loved. The, it's interesting because before I came to work here, I lived around the corner from the Coventry Library and would take a streetcar to the Cleveland, to 131st. 
And then we moved out to Warrensville Heights, and then I came back to Coventry to work. So it was, and I didn't drive at the time. I didn't drive at the time. I took four buses to get to Coventry Library. I was like a, a, a CTS dispatcher. I had all the schedules. Where are you going? I get out. The, really? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I've seen a lot, but I have always just loved this library. So what changes have you seen in that time period? In that time period? Mm -hmm. Or well, even after? Uh -huh. uh, that time period, really, oh, the time uh, that I was, well, from when I first started till, till I left was a very exciting time, generally. Um, the, the advent of computers. Mm -hmm. In fact, I wrote an article, I forgot, it's in the library, was that the library journal? Ohio Libraries, where I projected 20 years from now, whenever that was, I can't remember the year. Mm -hmm. Might be interesting to look at. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think, yeah, it was the, the Ohio Libraries. I didn't think about that or I would have brought it. Yeah. They asked a director of a large size library like Cleveland Public to comment on the future, that kind of thing, and of a medium size, which we were, and they asked me to do it representing the medium size. So I did, and I can't remember all that's in and out, but it was a very interesting uh, to project and to what we were doing. And of course, we, again, I always said, and people have said that about our library, that we're always ahead of, ahead. Mm -hmm. We were the first library outside the Cleveland Public Library to audit. I mean, they extended an invitation to all the suburban libraries and we accepted to join. And that's how we got computerized as quickly as we did. It took the other libraries some years. Yeah, so, so we always kind of jumped in. Mm -hmm. We were the first library to open on Sundays Yep. Um, what else were we the first? A lot of firsts, really. We always had not only an innovative staff, but a wonderful community mm -hmm. who asked for things that didn't seem way out, you know. I mean, sometimes they were, but, but they pushed us, pushed us uh, to open on Sunday. Mm -hmm. And I remember our first Sunday that we opened uh, Sarah was our director then, and she was down at a at a uh, workshop in Columbus. And this was a Sunday, and I was here. And we had agreed that if we circulated, how, I've forgotten how many books we would circulate. It would be worth staying open. But in point of fact, we circulated 1,200 books the, the first Sunday we were open. Mm -hmm. And I called her that night in Columbus. She said, well, I guess we're open to stay. And we were. And we were. Yeah. So that was a big change. Uh, we had a very interesting history because we sold our Coventry Library mm -hmm. to the, the Fairmount Center for Performing Arts. Took just two rooms, the two back rooms in the library as the library. Well, that and and I think we did the right thing. It, it, it was a battle. Uh, the community was very unhappy, but it, cost wise, it was the thing to do. And and people, most people came to Maine, you know, and drove and that kind of thing. And we had, <laughs> we said that our population base could not grow in the Coventry area because over here, over Mayfield, and we said there are dead people because there were two cemeteries there. So that that's why we did it. But the community was never quiet, never, ever quiet. It was quite amazing. But democratic times and, and all that, and ultimately I reopened it. Sarah had already retired, and I was the director then, and then we started to work on it, and the board said, let's look at it again and we reopened it. I was not happy, but it, it's okay. It's a beautiful building. And I always said, we didn't do that much library service, but we do a lot of community service there. So it sort of helped me to 
realize <laughs> and to be comfortable with it. But that was a very, to, to sell a building and then to buy it back mm-hmm. was an interesting experience. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah. Yeah, the Cleveland Foundation helped us greatly with that. Um, in, in forgiving some of the money and then giving us some of the money to be able to buy it back. Yeah, uh-huh. yeah. Mm-hmm. So, very interesting times. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, we kind of mentioned that computers were a, a major change for the world, yes. right? Yes. Um, what were some of the other big changes? In terms of library services that we provide, anything else help interacting with the community as well? Well, actually, when we came into this building, uh, we really became a community center. The meeting rooms took over. I mean, we didn't have to... We had them in the branches, but nothing like, like this. And the hours. The, uh, uh, this building, as you know, was open all hours, and we we did increase branch hours a bit, but basically, it was the materials that we had. We had a very fine collection. Mm-hmm. Uh, people came from all over to find things that they didn't find elsewhere. And then, of course, we went into very early on. We went into records, which turned into CDs, that and all that kind of thing. Uh, but the major change really was computers, yeah. And, and as you know, over the years, it became more and more and more, you know, really. And I hate it. I do. I, I, I'm, I just don't like them. I, I, I'm not good at it, <laughs> which is why, yeah. yeah. But when we, when we converted the collection, uh, I did input some books into, the, into the, uh, the computer, but not many. I think that's when I decide it's time for me to leave. <laughs> so that was kind of the birthplace of Clevenet, right? Yes, and yes, that. that's right. right. Yeah, Cleveland Heights joined, Cleveland Public, and then Euclid Public joined. And then ultimately, all the East Side libraries joined. Um, Westlake and Rocky River did not, and I don't think they have till I don't know. Yeah, I would have I'm, to look that up. Yeah, I can't. I don't know if they finally did, but they didn't. Yeah, it was very interesting. Yeah. yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So we talked a little bit about how the buildings have changed in terms of Coventry, selling it and buying it back, redoing Maine. What sort of renovations did you see um, during your time here? Well, as I mentioned, this was, of course, a major right. renovation, right. taking a branch and extent, making it quite large, and it became the main library in Coventry we talked about. Um, Lee, of course, that's the branch that became this, so we just now have Noble. Um, and Noble and University Heights Library both, we did renovations, but not big ones. Not, since I'm gone, they have done lovely renovations, yeah. But again, you know, money only goes so far, you know. And uh, the small renovations that we did worked, mm-hmm. but as time progress, we needed to do more, and they have done more. Yeah, um, Noble now, I think, is pretty much on the main floor. If I, the children's room is in the basement. Right. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. But University Heights has been on the main floor, uh, although all the, all the amenities are not. For instance, there's no washroom on the main. Mm-hmm. So some of that's going to happen, I understand now. Mm-hmm. Uh, but basically, all, and some people comment on it that all the money went into this building Uh, because if we were going to have a big important main library we had to Mm -hmm. in order to accommodate yeah Mm -hmm. yeah because we didn't have enough books when when Coventry Coventry was small we increased the collection greatly when we came into this library Mm -hmm. greatly so that there were more materials for everybody, mm-hmm. yeah, in all kinds. Uh-huh. And interlibrary loan, because of Cleve Net, became even more 
important and more used, mm -hmm. uh, where people would come in and request books from, El and we could get them from elsewhere. Mm -hmm. you know, that that came in that period too when we did that, and during that period. Before Clevenet, there was a little, or not so little, an organization that had all the libraries in the North called CAMELS, Cleveland Area Metropolitan Library Service. And our supervisor of adult services, Nancy Worm, was appointed the director. So we always, and I must tell you one thing, this is really very neat. You know, when you go to library conferences all over the country and and even if you're on your own, like when I would visit someplace, I'd say, I'm from Cleveland, where? I said, well, what do you do? Well, I work at the Cleveland. Oh, Coventry Library. I cannot tell you how many people across the country remember Coventry Library in their youth. Okay. Really, yeah. which was so neat. And it happened very often. So it, it, so I must comment on it. You know, it wasn't like once or two, but very often. Oh, Coventry Library, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it was sort of interesting that uh, we're, we're known, kind of. Mm -hmm. Trying to think what else. We, we, we were innovative, and I know I'm forgetting. I know I'm forgetting some things, because we, we really were sort of ahead in so many ways. Uh, the Sunday service, um, the computers. There was another big one. I'm trying to think. This isn't innovative, but it's important. We had at that, I don't think we do now. I think county has gone over us in this respect. But we always had the highest per capita circulation for years and years. When I was interviewed to come to the, to come to the Heights system, Miss Lynch said to me, this is a very literate community. They will read the New York Times on Sunday and come in Monday and ask for the book. And it's true. It was true. You know, so we had to be up, up on it all the time, yeah, because we had such a, a good, yeah, good community, really good community. I'm trying to think. We had wonderful, we had wonderful boards of trustees. We could not have done what we did if they weren't understanding, forward-looking, ready for a new idea, and uh, it, w it was a pleasure to work with every board I ever had. It, they, they were just wonderful. They really were. They were. They were real community servants. They had no hidden agendas, none. They wanted to serve the community through the library. It was wonderful. What else? So we mentioned serving the community, because that's been a major part of your That was a very big, big thing that we got into the community. Absolutely. Absolutely. So how has that, how has Cleveland Heights and University Heights changed over time? In that respect? Or in that respect, in terms of population shifts or... Well, there, there are population shifts, there's no question. And, uh, oh, the other, the other innovative thing that we did was, I don't know what to call it, just, just a minute, let me think a minute, um, quiet study rooms. No, we, you know, we realize that the library should be a living, breathing thing that you shouldn't come in sh like in the old days. So we were one of the first to do a quiet study room for the kids. You're studying seriously, up or wherever it was. In this building, I think it was on the main floor at the time. Yeah, that was another big thing, and other libraries have adapted that now too. Oh yeah, that that was really a big thing. When you say changes, I was thinking of the kids. Yeah, yeah. and. Uh, we also hired one year because kids were, were beginning to be somewhat as they are now, somewhat obstreperous, shall we say. So we hired not a librarian, but a youth worker to come in every day after school and just mill around and be with the kids and 
just see what they were up to and talk with them, make them feel welcome, make them understand that they weren't to cut up in the library. They were to they were here for a reason. Mm -hmm. And we did that we had him for about two years. It was at the time when the community was changing and becoming more African -Amer American. And we had an African American young man who took this position. And and the kids looked up to him and they listened to him. Not every kid, but but basic but it was a very good thing. Mm -hmm. Very good thing. Because that, combined with the quiet study area, made it a more pleasant experience for adults. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because we had so many youngsters, and they were so abstract. Not always exuberant, shall we say. You know, so we, we did that. That was another thing that we did. We did lots. God, when I think about it, we really did. And, and they weren't always our ideas, I must say this. We would go to conferences, and we'd hear what other libraries were doing around and some of them we thought we could adapt and some of them we couldn't you know and and we learned a lot from going to conferences that and and that was a very important part uh, for the staff to be able to attend professional conferences and learn mm -hmm. and they did and they really did and brought back ideas and, and that kind of thing yeah mm -hmm. do you remember what any of those ideas were that not were really <laughs> Not yeah. really. I mean, but just all incorporated into our uh, way of, of serving the public. Yeah. You know, I, I, I'm away 88, 27 years. Mm -hmm. That's why I say I should have boned up. <laughs> well, although I do remember a lot, I do. It, it, it was a wonderful experience. Wonderful staff. Wonderful staff, wonderful board. Wonderful. Couldn't ask for more, really. It was really a wonderful experience. And when we first opened and we had a parking lot, was it as big as it is now? I think so, because we didn't have much more. To, but people would come in and chomp up to my office here on the second floor, and they'd say, can't find a place to park. And I would say, isn't that lovely? <laughs> it's a nice problem. To have. I, I always, I loved it. And when I came in today, I went around. So what, what we did before we expanded, when we expanded the main library, you know, uh, after we were here a while, we did some more work and expanded. So then we knew we had to do something, but we didn't know what we were going to do. So we did a parking survey. We had our pages sit out there, and every parking space was delineated, and they would mark parking space A, person came in at 420, say, left 430. So we had all this data, and we saw that many people came for not more than 10 minutes. You know, they came to to leave their books and pick up and leave, and pick up a new one and leave. So that's again what we used to say. We say if you drive around more than one, and it it works, it really does. But that that was very interesting when we did. Wow, wow, <laughs> it really, it was was wonderful. I loved it. I said, isn't that lovely? <laughs> they were sort of taken aback when I'd say that. But then I would say, why don't you try? And it, and it kind of worked. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so we, we have what we have. <laughs> Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So this is kind of going back to buildings. Um, how have those renovations or the changes to the buildings affected the cities? So changes to University Heights, affecting University Heights, or the portions that, mm -hmm. that the libraries serve? On a very, very pleasantly, no big effects, because it, uh, now I think what we're going to do at UH, I think the city will have more impact than before. But basically, Noble and University Heights were sort of internal renovations, so they didn't particularly, they just made it more comfortable for people mm -hmm. to come in. Yeah, this is the the big building that did uh, affect, and and the downgrading of Coventry also did. As I mentioned, the community was very unhappy, um, really for a very long time. Yeah, it was. 
but we worked it through and it seems to be working well now. And as I say, it's more of a community center. The other big thing when I was, it was actually the very last thing I did, uh, we introduced service to the deaf at Coventry. Yeah, I, I left July 6th and in June I wrote the grant. The Cleveland Foundation helped us for service to the deaf. And th that became the place to go for hearing impaired people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and we've done a lot with that, yeah. And that was a wonderful thing to do for them. It was. Somehow they, oh, most of them seem to live around there too, which mm -hmm. is why we, we chose to do it there. A couple of them came in and talked to us about it, you know. Mm -hmm. We said, well, I had never written a grant in my life. That was the one and only grant that I wrote. Uh -huh. Yeah, but it worked and, and it's, been, it's been successful. Yeah, it has. So, and we had, had the other thing we were always careful in the diversity of our staff, not only in race, but in other areas. We had, I don't think Sheila is here anymore. We had Sheila, who was a very slow learner, but once she learned something, she never forgot it. And we hired her first as a page. Mm -hmm and then as a full-time person. And her mother came in and thanked us because the fact that she was working all those years gave her a pension. Mm -hmm. And she was so relieved that her daughter would be okay. Yeah, and she, she may not be here anymore. Uh, I haven't seen, I, whenever I'd come in, she'd come running up to me because I knew her before she worked actually. You know, she rode her bike and she would come into the library and I got to know her. And um, that was one. And, and I didn't think of her first, and I thought of the other one. But the, the same idea that we wanted to give all these people an opportunity, uh, we felt very strongly that with public money, mm -hmm. we should serve the greater community in all ways that we could. And that was one of the ways that we did. We had uh, hearing impaired people and Sheila and... Uh, yeah, that yeah, that was a, Sheila was a spin-off when we were talking mm -hmm. about the hearing impaired, and and uh, we did a lot in the community. I don't mean just having uh, meeting rooms, but I was out f three to five nights a week in, co in community meetings and stuff, pushing the light. Now you know I was there pushing, but I was there so the library was represented in all areas. Uh, of the communities in that in all kinds of organizations, mm -hmm. all kinds. Yeah, uh, I think that was a very big part of our success. Was the outgoing kind of thing? I mean, what we did here, many libraries did, but not all libraries were out as much as we were in the mm -hmm. community. Yeah, I, I would say that I spent a lot of time. Out particularly when I was the assistant director, because I always said I had the best job as assistant director. I worked with the public, I ordered the books, and poor Sarah was left with the budget. I learned. <laughs> yeah, no, I, that was the perfect job, mm -hmm. just to be out there and, and learning and so on. So what sorts of form did that, um, sorts of forms, I can talk, um, <laughs> did that outreach take? So. Did, sounds like a lot of committee meetings out into the community. Were there services that the library was providing? We, we began ultimately to do some services, like service, uh, and all libraries do it now, uh, to the homebound and mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Uh, and, you know, if we were at a, we used to have, um, what were they called? I want to say a fair, F-A-I-R, but there's a better word, you know, a big, kind of thing where lots of organizations would come and we of course would be there with our wares, with our books and so on. Um, but not always did we do that part, but I always had an opportunity to speak about the library at, at all these meetings, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, I was president of the Heights Chamber of Commerce, for instance. Well, I really had a you know, being the president, I really was able to push the library out and that that kind of thing and, and make all these businesses aware of us uh, without pushing that much, just the fact that they knew what I did. 
Did it, you know, yeah. Uh -huh. No, and, and that too, I really did encourage staff to get out into the community, no matter how. I mean, I wanted them to be on committees if, you know, time allowed and so on, and we tried to make time for them, you know, for, for meetings and that kind of thing. So uh, that was the, the great interaction that we had. And that's where we learned a lot about what people wanted, mm -hmm. you know, just, just being there and friendly and that kind of thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, but even before I became director, we had a very high standard for the collection. We really did, which is why we had people come from all over the, the county, because we really did. I mean, they said, we couldn't find this anywhere. We really had a very high, because, again, of the community. We knew who we were serving. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, it was a wonderful, wonderful collection. I, I still hear you know, I love it, you know, when I'm out and something, and so, oh, I didn't know. I said, I love it, tell me more. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was fun. But I would say that the fact that we passed, while I was here, I think three, the first levy was 63, I think. Then there was another levy. So Sarah did two, and I did two. I think, yeah, we, we, there were four, four levies, plus the bond issue. That was right. before the, that was before the uh, levies, the bond, yeah. So th that says a lot, mm -hmm. you know, in a short period of time, if you think about it. Um, no, that, that was a very exciting time, passing those levies. It really was. Trying to think. Let me just take a step. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I was going to crib and I didn't. Yeah. Services. Maybe that'll jog my memory a minute, but I, I don't know. But see, that also goes way back because the first librarian uh, went to the Heights movies to pitch the library when it first opened. Okay. So, so it goes way back, uh, the, the kind of service. Miss Keeler, yeah, she's the one. Uh-huh. Yeah. And we did, there, there's a picture, and it may be in here, of, of our first bookmobile. Way back we did a bookmobile. Where are all those pictures? I know what's in there. Yeah. And of course, we uh, we founded the Friends of the Library mm -hmm. in 1962. Um, the wife of one of our wonderful board members came to us and said, "We think we should have a Friends." Of the Sounded good to us, and, and that came along very. And they have been very good to us. I think all the libraries now have Friends. Friends of the, the Cleveland Public did, but otherwise. Yeah, well, we did. Well, we, we actually were the largest of all the suburban libraries, so that it made kind of sense that we were a little bit ahead always because we were a little bit larger, a little bit more staff, more money, that, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, what else? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, if you gave me all day, things would yeah, conti yeah, sure. continue to come. Yeah. So having been away from Heights Libraries for, what did we say, 27 years? 27. What changes have you seen since you've Oh, left? tons, tons. The, the, uh, the technology is way just mar marvelous for those who like it, <laughs> uh, really. Uh, and I mean, this, for instance, all this, this is just amazing. It really is. Yeah, that, that I think that that's really the big thing. Uh, it sort of overshadows almost everything else. You know, uh, the fact that library schools, they're now called schools of information and libraries sort of touch. At the end. I mean, shows, you know, what's happened, yeah. But but we don't stand still. Nobody stands still. You have to move ahead. No, the big change in, li in the library world was automation, no question. No question about it. And, uh, and just whatever your individual community 
needs was a was an important thing that people began to understand. Directors and so on began to realize that they had to serve their particular community. You know, um, even though there was this wonderful Cleveland Public Library, the Superior Branch, it's it's not there anymore, unfortunately. Uh, it, and I sometimes wonder why that made such an impression on me, but it did. It just did. It's just. It seemed perfect when I walked in, because I didn't know what I was going to do, you know. I hadn't even thought about it yet, yeah. Um, and the fact that I could go to school on the co-op plan made it wonderful for me, and got a job at the, at the library to really make it work was wonderful, wonderful. Um, so it, it was, was a, it's a wonderful it's a wonderful profession because you can fit in everywhere a librarian everybody needs either an archivist or a librarian every every institute kind of institution and archivism is becoming a big thing because of automation which is wonderful but lots of things aren't written anymore you don't, you, you know so the archivist got to pull it all together yeah yeah as I say there's a lot good but I I'm concerned about um, good history which won't be but that they won't know what they're missing <laughs> they won't know uh, but we, we watched our library grow Re really once we came here it really took off you know we needed to do it. I mean, that was the whole point, is that we were just suffocating, really. Coventry was too small. We couldn't do the job that, that we felt needed to be done. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, and people accepted it as long as Coventry stayed there. <laughs> but when it closed... <laughs> But again, it was like theirs, you know. Yeah, yeah. And it's a beautiful building, too. Mm -hmm. it, it really is. Uh, it is. People, some people would pass it and think that it was a church. Mm -hmm. yeah, you know, it sort of had that. That's, I said, no, no, it's a library. So, did I give enough good things here? I think so. The good things that we've done and that... Definitely. It's a good good perspective on everything. Yeah. And as I say, service was really important in helping people and being in the in the community, not stand off, being a part of the community. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know if they still I think they still have it. The 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 city council of both cities the library and the school board meet used to meet, and I think they still do. I don't think they gave that up. But we were a very important part of that group that met. We didn't do. We made lots of recommendations. We weren't a governing kind of, so we couldn't do big. But we could always recommend and talk about policy and stuff. And the library was always very important in those groups. I mean, you know. Uh, as well as as the school board, of course, um, and that kind of thing. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much for. I enjoyed. I enjoyed. I, I really did. Good. And if I had boned up a little bit more. No, yeah, that's the part about oral history. Is yeah, I think so. Bit. Yeah, I th I think so. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah, see, those were the last, yeah, Sarah, and then I came after Sarah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And she was the one who hired me. Okay. And she was a character. She, re she really was quite a character. I'm looking for that little bookmobile, not so little. Oh, this was the groundbreaking for this building. And Sarah, who was my boss, was in Florida because her mom had just died. So I had to represent the library there. Yeah. <laughs> and I didn't know what I was going to say. You know, I had to yeah. say something. And I said to my husband, what am I going to say? I don't know what to say. 
he said, what is, what is all this for? What are you doing all this for? I said, well, we need more books. We need more space. He said, that's it. Just go in there and say, books, books, books. And that's how I started it. Today, you wouldn't say that. I mean, you would say other things, but that just shows. But I was petrified that day. I didn't know what I was. But, but that's what I said. And that's what we did. I mean, we just increased. Yeah, that that was an exciting day too. That really was. Yeah. This. I don't know. No. I I can just see that picture, but I don't seem to see it in here, of the book. Ah, oh, there it is. There it is. I I overlooked. So we we did. There we are. Okay. See? Yeah. See, that's from way back. Yeah. See? The twenties. So we were doing that then. Charles was our custodian and he also did that. See, this was in the twenties and I came in, in fifty four and he was mm -hmm. still with us. And Charles, yeah. Yeah. So she she was Yep. Are you interviewing others? Yeah, um, I actually I interviewed Steve Wood last Did, week. Was he here or was no? I interviewed him over Skype, so yeah. using the computer. Yeah, yeah. Oh, good, good. I'm sure he had lots of interesting. He did. Well, he did. I must tell you, we never would have computerized without him. Yeah. He would never admit it, but he, we never. He, I mean, I couldn't do. I didn't understand it. I could, but he was. Yeah, he was the one. He was just wonderful. Yeah. Good, good. yeah. Yeah. He was fun to talk to. Oh, he's he's a great guy. Yeah. Yeah. And before that, we interviewed um, Susan Black and Maureen Weisblatt uh -huh. from UH. Uh huh. Um, and then Amia, who is also doing the oral history, she's interviewed a couple other people. Mm -hmm. um, I think she was interviewing Ann Gornick from Noble. Yeah. Circulation. Mm -hmm. Are you doing any board members? We aren't. Um, I think you should. Okay. I really do. Um, do you have any names? I, I, was, I was trying to think who would be a wonderful board, board member to interview. They were all so good. Um, I don't know if Paul Salapante is still in town. S-A-L-I-P-A-N-T-E. He understood libraries well and when we went, went for what did we go for a, I remember him saying oh when he applied to be on the library board he said he wanted to of course be on the board because he thought he said I don't know that I can improve on such a wonderful <laughs> institution so of course I'm naming here but no he was very smart man very smart young man young man very smart very smart and who no I think I think you need to have a board perspective uh, and I wish I'm afraid that whoever was on the board at the Coventry fiasco is no longer Mr. McCracken would have been wonderful but he's gone now I'm, I'm just looking through here but Paul would be wonderful um, I'll tell you who. Annette Butler. Okay. She is an attorney, African American, fabulous board member. Fabulous. We could not have done what we did without her. She lives on East Boulevard. So you can find her in a telephone book. Okay. Yeah. Annette would be marvelous. I'll yeah. Look into that. Yeah, yeah. She saved us so much money because she was a lawyer. She is a lawyer. She actually works for the city of Cleveland. She's a lawyer in their law department. She's involved in all this, but she's a wonderful person. Um, but she, she did because if I had any problems, like when we bought the Coventry Building back, she helped us with that. And when I had very difficult personnel problems, and I did have a few that were could not have done it alone. She guided me through it. Mm -hmm. You know, she, she she was wonderful, wonderful. Yeah, and that would be just, and I just talked to her last week, as a matter of fact. Okay. Yeah. So I'll look into that. Yeah. 
Um, if you think of anybody else that you think we should interview, definitely let us know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I think we've also got Becky on the list and Bill Rubin. Oh, oh Bill. <laughs> My baby, Bill. <laughs> Bill is Bill something. <laughs> I tell you, it was just, just a wonderful group of people from the board down. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and I think that's what it takes. It really does. It takes the top, which is the board, to kind of set the parameters, and then you find people that sort of fit in that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But Steve. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you very much again. I love doing this. Good. Good. I hope it was helpful. I'm getting old, and I can't remember everything anymore.